So we have been looking at the solution uh, for the Berg Schumann problem uh, and uh, what we can now figure out is uh, we want to actually interest we are interested in the flame height surprisingly for uh, tall laminar flames that means we still have the situation of Peclet number being quite large but still not into the turbulent regime uh, the Berg Schumann solution gives a very good prediction of the flame height and this was significant uh, back in 1928 uh, if you think about it. So the way you actually can find out the flame height is as I said a gamma equal to 0 is going to give you the flame shape um, and of course it is going to change switch from a um, under ventilated flame on the one side to a over ventilated flame on the other side. So uh, depending upon whether it is under ventilated or over ventilated you need to evaluate uh, this expression setting gamma equal to 0 for the eta all right uh, now plugging in psi equal to either 0 or 1 right so with this you can get the flame shape. So let us do this for at least one of those so uh, uh, for so for the overventilated case say psi equal to 0 eta max that is the height of the flame um, so you can now plug this in here of course what happens is you now have a gamma equal to 0 and then you have this expression which is the series. Uh, summation and uh, we are trying to find out eta on top of this exponent sitting there with a the negative sign in each and every term right that is quite difficult to do. So one thing uh, you can do is to recognize how the series is going to behave and then say as a, as a first approximation let us not worry about the series let us consider only the first term in the series right as a leading term and then the remaining remaining terms are corrections to it therefore uh, approximate to the first term uh, in the summation uh, with phi 1 equals 3.83 this is something that you can find out from the Bessel's function tables so there is like a uh, table of special functions which will give you values of these zeros so we are looking at the, the Bessel function of first kind the first zero of that uh, you will find that in the table uh, phi 1 is equal to 3.83 keep this in mind and then you get a eta max all you have to do is uh, get rid of the summation wherever you have n you just put equal to 1 uh, because you are looking at only the first term and uh, this thing goes to the left hand side this thing comes down and uh, then uh, uh, you, you have this and then you find that this is actually e to the negative right. So if you now want to flip everything and uh, take a na natural logarithm then you will get a uh, phi n phi n squared eta uh, eta equals eta max and therefore if you now get the phi n squared also to the uh, denominator on the other side you will get it as 1 over phi 1 squared natural logarithm um, 2 plus sorry 2 twice of 1 plus nu uh, times c j1 of c phi 1 divided by nu minus uh, nu, nu minus 1 plus nu c squared. Uh, when this goes to the left hand side you get a negative sign so this flips uh, times phi 1 g naught of phi 1 right. So this, this gives you a good idea of what the flame length should be but what do we learn from this <laughs> ok. 
okay do we know how the flame is going to uh, how the flame sh flame length is going as a matter of fact it is difficult to find out how the flame shape is going to be with this expression uh, and as I said this is how the flame looks like but if you now look at this expression for the flame length you cannot see the dependencies in the problem right. So how, the, how do you set up this problem you now have these coaxial pipes and then you want to send fuel and oxidizer together at particular I should not say together I mean in, in, in each of these uh, pipes uh, at the same velocity that is what I meant by together right. So the same velocity and uh, uh, the, the uh, C is your variable as I said and your YF0 and YO0 are your, are your control variables these are the ones that you are trying to control uh, depending upon YF0 and YO0 the new is going to get fixed right so you can, you can you can do all that but how is it how does it vary or for that matter is the flow velocity showing up here no because the flow this parameter this this equation was primarily this solution was primarily obtained for neglecting the axial diffusion all right so we will do a couple of things now first let's think about what happens when you now try to keep axial diffusion all right and I am not going to solve that problem I will let it let you let you figure that but I will tell you what are this what are the possible steps that that can get in there and the second thing is and then what are the consequences and the second thing is let us look at the dependencies okay. So the first thing is if you consider axial diffusion. diffusion is included rather than neglected right we would have we would have u over d dou beta by dou z equal to dou squared beta by dou z squared plus 1 over r dou by dou r or dou beta by dou r previously we did not have this term we are now trying to keep this right. So what is the consequence of this first of all you could say that r is still governed to second order and therefore it requires two boundary conditions the two boundaries in r are r equals 0 and r equals b and I would like to supply boundary conditions there and I expect to have symmetry boundary condition at r equal to 0 so dou beta by dou r is equal to 0 that is a Neumann condition and at the wall I have a rigid non porous wall so I cannot have diffusion through that wall so I still have no diffusion mass flux which amounts to dou beta by dou r is equal to 0 at r equals b at the, at the outer wall and so I get Neumann boundary condition there. As far as the z boundaries are concerned this is now suddenly begin, beginning to be governed by second order previously it was governed only to first order now you, you have actually a second order term that is governing this right. So whatever we neglected was somewhat pretty important I mean it, it, it actually reduces the order of the equation by 1 which means it does not permit an additional boundary condition whereas this one demands an additional boundary condition that means you have to give two boundary conditions in z okay the domain for z is z equal to 0 which is something that we considered earlier and z equals infinity so you now can actually go all the way up to infinity here and that is where you have to supply the boundary condition. What do I know about beta at z equal to infinity or its derivative? And now you, now you have a very important situation you see because you have this governed to second order not only it demands two boundary conditions but it can also permit a boundary condition in the derivative okay. So you already had two boundary conditions and derivatives here and if you now allow if this admits boundary conditions in its in derivative that means you can you can specify dou beta by dou z at r equal to uh, sorry z equal to 0 and or dou beta by dou z at um, z equals infinity then you do not have a unique solution because you are you are supplying Neumann boundary conditions everywhere. 
therefore you need to supply Dirichlet boundary condition somewhere okay. Now previously we could supply only Dirichlet boundary condition because this is governed to first order and you could give only Dirichlet data. Now it is supplied it is governed to second order that means you can have a not only Dirichlet but also a mixture of Dirichlet and Neumann what is that how could I get that. So now you have a choice of different boundary conditions um, that you can give okay and they should mean something physically or in other words we should now interpret that physically okay. So if you go back to your original problem right so uh, beta is now governed to second order in z so need two bcs in Z for beta um, which implies uh, Z equal to 0 and Z equal to infinity okay also can admit Neumann BCs uh, in beta that is could specify do beta by do z at z equal to 0 or infinity but cannot specify all Neumann BCs that is uh, keeping do beta by do r equal to 0 at r equal to 0 and B as others okay uh, because this would lead to a non unique solution therefore could retain Dirichlet BC or mixed which is Dirichlet plus Neumann BC all right all we can say in fact at z equals infinity you do not have too much of a room to play with on what, what, what should be the boundary condition all we can say and hope for at z equal to infinity is that beta should be bounded we cannot specify values we cannot specify derivatives simply because you are expecting to get a exponential solution and since you have a second derivative now you, you can actually admit a e to the plus some constant times let us say phi n squared uh, e to the plus phi n squared eta plus some constant times e to the minus phi n squared eta and if you now admit the coefficient to e to the plus phi n squared eta as eta tends to infinity that solution is going to blow up. So by specifying that z equals infinity beta should be bounded we can get rid of the, the exponentially growing part of the solution and retain only the exponentially decaying part of the solution as before all right. So at z equals infinity we merely specify that beta remains bounded which eliminates the exponentially growing solution in beta 
uh, in E term sorry right and, and, and retains only the exponentially decaying solution eta as before as a matter of fact that is what boundary conditions are supposed to do boundary conditions are supposed to evaluate uh, co um, constants of integration that are appearing as coefficients to solutions and by just merely saying that beta should remain bounded as a boundary condition at z equal to 0 we, we evaluate the coefficient to the exponentially growing solution in eta as 0. So we have, we have done the job as far as that, that particular boundary condition is concerned. Then comes this right here is where it is important for us to decide whether we want to have a Dirichlet boundary condition or a mixed boundary condition. So this question of whether we want to have a Dirichlet boundary condition or mixed boundary condition arises primarily at z equal to 0 at the lip of the burner right that means it is now possible when you when you admit or include axial diffusion that you have a choice of boundary conditions either it could be the Dirichlet boundary condition that we used before which we did not have a choice about earlier or we can use the mixed boundary condition now. The question is what does the mixed boundary condition really mean right. So let us now think about the flow that is coming through one of these ports and now we are admitting axial diffusion right. So if you now go back and look at the solution so or if you now try to map the solution and say you have a flame that is supposed to be here right. What does that mean? This really means that you, you have a fuel rich region over here. This is the stoichiometric surface. This is the fuel, uh, fuel lean region around okay and there is a progressive change in the mixture fraction from a pure fuel or more fuel in the middle progressively to stoichiometric and then fuel lean okay. It is a varying region over there. What that means is if you now look at it along the axial direction or the stream wise direction you have more fuel here than here right. So it is sort of like as the as the fuel is coming out and, and flows up into the into the domain and you do not have the, the, the tube anymore it is now got into the domain it looks around and then sees wait a minute I am not there so let me go there right and then once it goes there it says hey wait a minute I am not there let me go there. What is that? That is axial diffusion okay. Now of course you might think wait a minute do not we have all the flow kind of coming up? Yeah that is that is what we had in premix flames also right. So but at that time what, what, what happened? We, we now decided that you are going to have a flame and the, pro, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the reactants are coming in and then they all getting converted to products and when the products are formed they suddenly get formed and then look around and then find it is all products over here no products over here can I diffuse backwards right and it tries to diffuse against the current, current meaning the convection right and it succeeds to some extent just as well as the heat gets conducted upstream even as the convection is actually carrying the enthalpy this way. If the heat could penetrate why cannot mass right it is after all both of them are transport processes. The similarly here you could have a current that is that is setting up set up set up upwards but you could have a, a reverse uh, diffusion that is for the fuel but think about the oxidizer the oxidizer does not even have to fight the current right the, the oxidizer uh, is, is here and it finds wait a minute there is more fuel over there right can I now go go up right. So along with actually convecting it begins to diffuse up right. So these axial diffusion processes the question is how good are they is a question of how well are they competing with convection. So when you do not have a large convective effect that means you are at fairly low velocities right in, in simple English huh? then you can you can now expect the axial convection axial diffusion to be more predominant alright. 
So this is a problem where the convection could predominate axial diffusion but balances radial diffusion all right. So the, the balance between radial diffusion and convection is, is the centerpiece of this but alongside at low convective effects you could have a significant contribution from axial diffusion as well. If you now think about that so you now say fuel is coming out like this diffusing like this and then going backwards oxidizer comes like this diffuses like this and or rather it can even diffuse like this and then goes backwards. If it did then the question is how good is the Dirichlet data correct we were imposing saying at the at the lip of the burner you have only fuel here and only oxidizer here that is what we did right but that need not be the case you could have the incoming fuel get contaminated by oxidizer that is diffusing from the other side right or products as a matter of fact huh? and similarly the oxidizer. So where can I expect to be sure that I do not have any contamination far upstream because you have a convection there is a certain length scale associated with the diffusion in competition with the convection right and beyond that length scale you, you can hope to have pure fuel and pure oxidizer but how do I know what that is unless I solve and for me to solve I need to know the boundary conditions so where do I go in search of the boundary do I want to now take like a minus infinity plus infinity in Z for the domain when, when in fact I am interested in what is happening here that is where what is called as a flux BC comes into picture right. So we could now think about a flux boundary condition. which is essentially a species balance that is integrated over a control volume for each of the species from minus infinity for the Z to over here knowing that this is going to be all fuel all right. So if you now take the governing equations and integrate within this control volume what you can now expect is we, we now know that you can say rho u yf minus rho d do y right at z equal to 0 should be rho u yf minus rho d yf by do z at z equals minus infinity there is hardly any thing that is going on along the walls you neither have convection nor diffusion along these walls right. So the, the, the control volume here that we are looking at is having exchange um, only at this surface and this surface at infinity far upstream. Far upstream we know that you do not have you, you have pure fuel and therefore you do not have any fuel concentration gradients so you do not have any diffusion to talk about right. So this goes away and you can directly now say this is equal to um, so you can say rho u yf at uh, z equal to 0 minus rho d dou yf by dou z at uh, z equal to 0 equals rho u yf naught right and then you can say yf at z equal to 0 minus d over u do yf by do z z equal to 0 equals equals um, yf not. So what has happened now previously we ignored this term we did not consider any diffusion that was happening axially across the inlet to your domain. We simply said yf at z equal to 0 is yf naught but now you have to subtract that amount that is actually diffused you see and what is that going to be like 
in fact if you think about axial diffusion including axial diffusion then the problem becomes somewhat symmetric in, in, in both z and, z and eta that means you do not have to worry about uh, sorry z, z and r that means if you now thought that the length scale of your r dimension was uh, b the burner width what you are essentially saying is it is diffusing along the radial direction just as well as it is diffusing along the axial direction at least to begin with that is a consideration we will have to evaluate how much this is versus that okay and that will be done by the Peclet number. So if you were to now say that z is also going to be of the order of b and then say um, uh, so for non dimensionalization non dimensionalization uh, of z as uh, sorry eta equals z by b okay same length scale for um, axial as well as diffusion this was not the case before we did not have an axial diffusion length scale um, uh, unless we actually started looking at what is the so flow versus the diffusion length scale. So we had to do something like z by b divided by u by um, uh, sorry uh, b squared by d and then we, we came up with a new non-dimensional number uh, sorry uh, coordinate eta last time but if you do this then uh, yf at z equal to 0 minus you now get a b out here right so you can have a d yf not or yf minus 1 over pecle do y I am sorry do yf by do psi at z equal to 0 equals yf not right now this is what is called as a flux boundary condition and it is a mixed boundary condition it now has a linear combination of value and derivative together right this is sort of like y a y f plus b do y f by do psi where a is equal to 1 b is equal to minus 1 over pecle okay it is a linear combination that is what is a mixed boundary condition. So the summary of what we are talking about is that uh, axial consideration of axial diffusion permits permits um, diffusion at the inlet boundary right and leads to flux sorry a mixed boundary condition. Now mixed boundary condition is all right because it still involves some Dirichlet data right yes I am sorry did I keep making that mistake psi and eta are Greek. Sorry. Right. As a matter of fact, uh, psi, psi is equivalent of x, and eta is actually equivalent of what? It's it's, it's not z. It is actually h. So that's that's why the confusion. We should have, we should have been using zeta. All right. So. All right. So. Now, question. We we can ask two questions. One. All right. I have axial diffusion okay but let me insist on having only the Dirichlet boundary condition as before that is possible mathematically that is correct okay it may not be physically correct in some situation 
but mathematically that is okay you can do that. What would be the effect of considering axial diffusion okay with just a Dirichlet boundary condition as before the answer is if you that now begins to depend on a new parameter which is called Peclet number before we did not have Peclet number we had a non dimensional governing equation without any parameters. But now what will happen is you will have a 1 over Peclet squared showing up and clearly what that means is as Peclet number is large the axial diffusion effect relative to axial convection is going to be small okay. That means axial diffusion is important mainly for small Peclet numbers right. So small Peclet, so Peclet number here is obviously U B U divided by D this is the mass diffusion counterpart of Reynolds number that I pointed out yesterday uh, and uh, what that means is at small Peclet numbers your, your convection is not as uh, convection is not predominating over diffusion okay diffusion is quite important and therefore you will now end up with a flame that is a bit fatter and shorter right. So this is for so th this is the way you are going to get things to go as Peclet number increases and the Berkshuman solution that we saw so far neglecting axial diffusion is in the uh, limit of infinite Peclet number all right. So the, the job of uh, axial diffusion is to make the flame shorter because the, you have more mixing happening um, axially as well as radially and that therefore you get a shorter and a, and a bit fatter flame correspondingly. Then the question the next question that we have to ask is well fine now I have axial diffusion and then I, I look at the problem and then decide that I want to have a mixed boundary condition which means I want to have a flux boundary condition like this what do I do how does how does the flame look like right. The answer is if you now had a, uh, a Berkshuman solution with axial diffusion and Dirichlet boundary conditions if you had a flame that looked like that your flux BCs are going to actually make sure that you, your, your of course your domain starts here right your flame starts somewhere there. That means the flame is no longer going to be attached to the rim of the burner. right why was it attached to the rim of the burner before because we did not permit axial diffusion across the interface uh, sorry across the uh, across the inlet and therefore when the fuel and oxidizer met the first opportunity at which they could meet was right at the burner lip and they meet at stoichiometric stoichiometric proportions there and then on in a certain curved manner and therefore the stoichiometric surface starts from the lip of the burner like what we have shown here. But when you have axial diffusion taken into account you can now permit mixing to happen this way across uh, upstream of the uh, inlet to the domain and therefore you could find the fuel and oxidizer being in stoichiometric proportions away from the lip of the burner that that is possible and uh, we are not strictly speaking drawing what is happening inside because we are not solving for it. Our boundary condition is still applied only here and our solution starts only into this domain right. So we do not know we do not know exactly what is happening but this is permitted okay. So this is the consequence of having axial uh, sorry flux boundary conditions along with axial uh, diffusion taken into account uh, in, in the case of uh, uh, the Berkshuman problem. In general uh, if you look at the literature the, the, the term Berkshuman flame stands for infinite chemistry right that means we have not really bothered about uh, solving anything to do with finite rate chemical kinetics. So you can have for example Berkshuman spray flame like, like, like you have a spray of uh, droplets and the droplets are burning and uh, uh, what it means is basically that as the droplets evaporate and uh, um, um, and the vapor from the droplet is mixing into the oxidizer let us say you are looking at fuel 
fuel droplets, fuel spray, right? Wherever you find the fuel vapor in stoichiometric proportion with the um, oxidizer, ambient gaseous oxidizer mixing into this, you now form a flame. That's a Bergschumann flame. Okay, and that's what you would call as a Bergschumann spray flame, right? You can also have something called a Bergschumann jet diffusion flame, or or a jet Bergschumann flame. So what that would mean is, I could I I don't have to have walls. Burke and Schumann were very clever you see they, they made these walls so that they do not worry about entrainment from the surroundings right this is a purely species mixing and convection problem they, they, they isolated the most important aspects of this very very well okay. So you could now think about a jet flame in which you have only the fuel coming out you have quiescent oxidizer everywhere right and it now gets entrained as well as diffuse and in this flow field you could, you could now think about wherever the fuel and oxidizer are present in stoichiometric proportions and that would be your Bergschumann jet flame. So on the one hand the Bergschumann problem would actually mean this problem a Bergschumann flame in the literature now comes to uh, mean any stoichiometric surface that is now coincident with a Bergschumann flame that is essentially what it means. That means we are adopting the infinite rate chemistry assumption or the flame sheet assumption or the mixed dis burnt approach or whatever it is all the, any, you, can, you can call it in any other way anyway this is what we are talking about. The second thing that we decided to talk about when we looked at this expression was what about the dependence on the flame height. Right? Do we get these get these dependencies? We don't get to see that right there, okay? And and part of the reason was Peclet number didn't show up because we had we had we had supposed infinite Peclet number there. In this kind of a formulation, you could hope to actually begin to see Peclet number show up in in places, and that would actually now denote the flow velocity relative to diffusion. Right, and then you can begin to see what is the effect of flow velocity, but still the expressions are going to be so complicated you do not get the physical feel, right. So it is easy for us to actually look at uh, what happens in a, in, a, in a order of magnitude manner. So order of magnitude all we are saying in this problem is a axial convection balances radial diffusion right. So what that means is you can now look at the axial diffusion axial convection time scale and axial convection time scale is essentially um, uh, let us suppose that you now have the flame length as uh, LF. So axial convection time is essentially the residence time of uh, reactants in the flame. The residence time is actually a very very basic and important idea um, that you will find happen to think thought about in design of combustors and so on. So when, whenever you want to actually design the length of a furnace right particularly for diffusion flames Pre previously we saw how what, what happens when you have ramjets and so on or afterburners the flame is the premix flame is held at the flame holder and then it gets inclined uh, of trying to burn into the reactant flow so that the the, the, the normal component of the, the flow velocity balances the flame speed of course it could be turbulent flame speed so you get the shape of the flame and therefore you get the length of the combustor all those things right. Essentially the idea basically there is what is the residence time of the reactants uh, within this region okay. So there what happens is you are looking at LF over um, U. So if this is the length of the flame then as the flow goes along the 
uh, along this it is going to be there for so long while it is there it is now diffusing this way right. So the diffusion time scale is as we saw yesterday we have b squared over d right therefore uh, therefore uh, if you now say L f over u is of the same order as b squared over d then L f which is the same as eta max here okay. So, so long as we were doing a uh, heavy duty mathematics we were we were using Greek like uh, eta, eta max and all those things but this is uh, just order of magnitude just thinking about this. So, we just uh, so you started using L f right that is the same thing. So, L f is uh, u b squared divided by d right. Now this is an order of magnitude idea and it works reasonably well not just for Berkshuman uh, problem or the Berkshuman geometry where you have coaxial ducts but even for jet flames. So if you have a jet that is coming out of a, a fuel jet that is coming out of a pipe of certain radius uh, r or diameter d you could still say do not worry about the fact that um, you, you have to use the outer, diame outer duct diameter the order is not going to be significantly different if you use the inner duct diameter all right. So, in, in a jet diffusion flame you have only one duct you do not have the outer duct it is it, it's, it, it's just entraining and diffusing with atmospheric quiescent air therefore you could simply say u, uh, u small d square divided by capital D where small d is like the diameter of the uh, jet right uh, or, or the inner pipe that is fine. Now what that means is uh, two things you can look at one the diameter squared is proportional to the cross sectional area right and the cross sectional area times velocity is essentially the volume flow rate like what you would measure with a flow meter let us say like um, liters per minute or meter cubes per minute or whatever it is right. So, um, so this is basically volume flow rate divided by the diffusion coefficient. So, you can look at it in two ways one either as a velocity burner diameter split or volume flow rate. If you look at it the first way you learn two things one the flame height is going to be proportional to velocity and proportional to square of the duct diameter all right. If you look at it the second way all you get is the flame is going to be proportional to the volume flow rate all right. So, larger uh, faster the flow that is coming taller the flame is going to be or larger the duct diameter much taller the flame is going to be or whatever is more the volume flow rate larger the flame longer the flame is going to be right that is what it means. Whatever we have done we have been talking we, whenever we talk about flow velocity we had to bring in the Peclet number in our in our uh, discussion and so on but all the when, when, when we do that and then I also said Peclet number is kind of like Reynolds number and so on but we never talked about turbulence right we are, we, are, we are not really worried about that. So, where is the question of that that and that why are we talking about it the reason why we are talking about it is as we keep on increasing the velocity at some stage or keep on increasing the volume flow rate or your diam duct diameter right at some stage you are now get into turbulent flows and then what happens. Well if you now have turbulent flows the diffusion that is going to happen is going to be a turbulent diffusion right and uh, there is not going to be molecular diffusion anymore. So, we have to now factor in the turbulent diffusion. So, the way you can do this is you can now look at the Schmidt number SC is essentially equal to nu over d uh, or uh, d goes as uh, nu over SC right. So, now for a constant Schmidt number let us not worry about how the Schmidt number goes uh, typically you, you know, we, we do not have to worry about that and uh, therefore L f goes as um, 
let's say u b square divided by nu right so if um, nu changes d changes through Schmidt number therefore if you want to talk about d as a turbulent mass diffusivity you can think about it in terms of uh, turbulent kinematic viscosity and a turbulent kinematic viscosity is a flow dependent parameter right and the way it goes is this goes is u b so sorry u right the, the, the greater the velocity more the turbulent viscosity greater the diameter this is because it, it depends on Reynolds number right. So if you now think about this then L f simply becomes proportional only to b that means uh, in, in, in fact I think I, I think I, I would feel a lot more comfortable uh, you can say also L f then is u d squared divided by d where d is fuel duct diameter I think it makes a lot of sense to talk about it in terms of in the context of jet flames and keep it as d rather than b because I am not thinking more about the outer duct diameter anymore mainly talking about the fuel duct diameter. So what this tells us is the flame the, the flame length is no longer going to be dependent on the flow velocity it simply is going to scale only with the duct diameter right. So if you look at the data what you should find is if you now plot your LF versus U what you will find here is LF is proportional to U, U B squared by D or U D squared by capital D so this is linearly increasing with D with U right. So for small U you get a linear increase all right but then you get into your transition region where you transition to turbulent flows and you now have a transition that now makes it insensitive ultimately to why is that because you have more and more mixing that is happening and as more and more mixing is happening you are having the fuel and oxidizer burn in stoichiometric uh, proportions much closer to the burner and that does not bec that, that, that becomes insensitive to the flow because more and more flow more and more burning can happen and all these things are happening within a very short within a pretty much constant distance right. So that is essentially what is going on as far as turbulent mixing and burning is concerned and therefore you, 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 you have a pretty insensitive flame uh, length to the flow velocity. So the, 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 the uh, uh, interesting picture I have in my mind about these things is, uh, is about our uh, uh, cartoons that we watch when we are kids like you, you, you have this dragon that's, that spews fire right like the spitfire dragon and it is a foo and then you now get a fire out of it and you can clearly see from there that uh, the, the greater the velocity greater is the flame length right and of course the, the, and then the dragon really wants to hurt you and then keeps increasing the velocity and, and if the flame length does not does not increase anymore because it has become turbulent and it starts blinking what the hell am I not able to make, make any impact so it starts opening up its mouth more and more and then the flame length increases and then and then it attacks the enemy right. So we can learn quite a bit of diffusion flames watching cartoons thank you very much. Mm -hmm.